Welcome back to the Gruber Morning Show. I'm Pete Gruber. This is Zane Courtney. Good morning. We are here to entertain you and uh, keep you up to date on clean energy initiatives, EVs, and uh, anything else that you guys can insert in there in the way of questions. Um, today, the picture behind me is a picture of my hometown in Rosenheim, which is in Bavaria, just south of Munich. And what makes this picture unique is, I don't know if you can see the whole width of it, but it's a panorama shot. And for those of you that don't want to spring for a expensive wide angle lens, Photoshop has a cool capability called Photo Merge. And what I was doing for years was actually taking my um, DSLR and taking multiple shots for a panorama and then just letting the software stitch it together into a magnificent wide angle shot. And that's what you see here. Um, the town square is not really that wide, but what you'll see is the characteristic multicolored um, uh, commercial or um, yeah buildings and the cobblestone streets. Everything in Europe is cobblestone. Um, so I'm hoping you're enjoying that image. We also want to remind everybody: um, send us your questions, and if you want to see the full image, those of you that are streaming on the other platforms, check us out on YouTube, and you'll get the full experience there. It's uh, Gruber Motors on YouTube. I believe it's also going up on uh, Instagram and TikTok. We're, we're kind of experimenting with some new tech to actually get you guys that background image on there as well. Um, so that's a good, that'll be exciting. It's a beautiful shot, mm -hmm. and it's a great little town. Heck, we ought to take a visit. There we go. We're, we're starting to see some of <laughs> hey, it here ourselves. There we go. So one of the first things I was going to cover with you guys today was um, I was talking to a lucid technician the other day and he said yeah he says you know we we've got problems with uh, people driving on the freeway it's raining and uh, we start getting complaints that um, the car lost power and they have to pull over to the side of the road and uh, the car's not going anywhere and uh, anyway it turns out that the issue is that right hand stalk that most people identify with the windshield wiper it's raining mind you right and uh, what they're trying to do is speed it up or slow it down, and instead they're putting the car in neutral, which then, of course, you do lose power and you have to pull over to the side of the road. And, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people think they're having a problem. Now, Tesla has the same issue because their right hand stock is also the propulsion stock. And, you know, we didn't know what to call it. We were going to call it, what is it, a gear shift lever? Gear stock or. Gear stock, drive neutral stock. Yeah. What, what do you call? I mean, the accelerator pedal is a no brainer. You can't yep. call it gas pedal anymore. In an EV, that becomes the accelerator pedal. But what do you call that thing that shifts you from neutral to drive to wherever? Because it also depends on the vehicle. Because you've got, I know I mentioned the Genesis before. I think it's the, um, oh, I forget what it's called. Something, something 60, EV60, sounds right. Uh, that's got the, the, uh, the, Lost my train of thought for a second. It's the knob. That's what it is. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that, 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 yeah, that round the same, knob. The same as like, a, you know, a yeah. Dodge Ram. Uh, the Ram 1500 has that same kind of dial, but the stock for Tesla is this kind of the new industry standard, I guess. And it's funny that people will go out and buy a Lucid without reading the instructions mm -hmm. on how to operate it and also ignore the, uh, the neutral logo whenever it actually is a neutral. <laughs> right. So the production team is here, and it looks like we're still dialing in some stuff. We're My focusing cameras, yeah. Focusing, okay. My question is, is are we at a point where we can bring up some pictures? Because I've got one that's going to require that. Yep, just one second here. Okay. Me... From uh, Sunny June 11 on TikTok, it's called a drive mode selector. Drive mode selector. Okay. Thank you very much. That makes sense. Yeah, from it's TikTok. A good name. <laughs> Outstanding. And it looks like we're getting another TikTok, uh, either question. Drive or... mode selector. You would. We never called it that in gas cars it was all it was a gear selector because you know you select yeah. the gear you're in you know if you're yeah. driving stick or if you're an automatic they still call it i guess a gear shift yeah because it automatically shifts gears and now it's which is funny actually i was just watching the monroe breakdown for rivian motors and there are still physical gears in the electric motors that change the drivetrain and all that so mm -hmm. i don't know why we even bother calling it anything different <laughs> it's still shifting gears 
But I, I guess it's more fun to call it the uh, the drive mode selector. The drive selector, drive I think, selector. is a good which one, yeah. is more it is more fitting because you have three drive modes to put it in: park, reverse, neutral, and drive. Oh, look at this! We've got a YouTube Brindle. comment from Exploration, <laughs> and uh, he says that it is the P R N D L, and it's pronounced Prindle. Put it in P yeah. in the Prindle. Okay, uh, that's a Pete? that's a Zach and Cody joke. Yeah. <laughs> what, what image did you want, Pete? Oh, let's pop up the image of the piano, the grand piano. And uh, this one I thought was pretty funny. Um, the, um, Elon was talking about the, uh, the Tessa robot and how safe it's going to be because it's not very powerful and strong and it can't really overwhelm you. Then a few weeks later, they show a Tesla bot's primary leg actuator lifting a half-ton concert piano. And um, what is... So anyway, what I found really interesting was some of the comments once this video came out. Now, if you could see this streaming, you would see that the piano is being picked up and set down, picked up and set there down. It is. The while actuators. The there. pianist, who happens to be a either SpaceX or Tesla employee, is playing a Chopin Nocturne. Uh, very well done, by the way. <laughs> but I love the comments that were attached to this video. One of them was. Imagine being chased by a robot whose legs can lift pianos. That's the irony <laughs> of the whole bit. It's like Elon's like, no, this is safe and fine, whatever. Oh, but it can, in fact, leg press pianos. Yeah. So here's another one. He says, I don't know what's more impressive, the bot lifting a piano playing or the man playing a lifting piano. <laughs> if you think about that, you know, when have you ever gone to a lounge and uh, saw the piano going up and down while the pianist is uh, entertaining, oh you know, the gosh. bar patrons, yeah. Um, it'd be a pretty metal concert, that's for sure. I don't know if it'd be a, <laughs> it'd be a pretty swinging lounge. So another that's one, funny. finally, I am tired of playing, I'm tired of paying eight people to move the grand piano up and down while I'm playing. So now Finally, we can use the Tesla A bot. great solution. You know, I can't wait until they put the legs on the piano and then they can have them walk around. And well, that could be part of the, a marching band. It could be. Could but be. I think the last one summed it up nicely. He says, next time, can we have the bot walk up to the piano, sit down, and play the piano? Oh, my gosh. Could we do a, a concert with the, uh, the Tesla, with uh, Optimus and Osimo? Oh, that would be awesome. I wonder if Osimo is still in production. Remember those? Don't remember those. It was a Honda experiment. It was the Honda first kind of iteration of a of a self capable robot. And this came out you know Very twenty cool. odd years ago, but uh, we saw a demonstration of it at Disneyland and had a great time looking at that. And I thought that's the future. I don't even know what you do with an awesome O, but now we know. Yeah. Now they can play Chopin. <laughs> I'm sure that our podcast is going to uh, spend a lot of time as these, as this Tesla robot and the other robots, now that we woke the world up that these things are coming and people are more focused and interested, um, some of the shenanigans that these robots are going to be pulling. And, uh, you know, what I found most interesting was is uh, Boston Dynamics, which mm -hmm. was one of the early um, uh, groups involved in uh, robot design and uh, robot creation. Um, they had a video where they were actually pushing the robot and, and it was falling down. Yes. And it created such an uproar because, you know, people uh, attached a human element to this. Yep. And that there was some sort of a, there's something wrong with that whole process. Well, it was a machine without any feelings. Right. Until we get the sentient AI and then that will change. If they have a pre-programmed opinion about that, we might have some problems. There's actually a great YouTube channel called Corridor Digital that did a set of fantastic parodies of those Boston Dynamics yeah. commercials where they'll just go and just completely be horrendous people to the robots and the robots will start fighting back and they did it beautifully animated they do 3d models and uh um uh, mocap and all that stuff to bring the robots to life for those very cool very cool youtube videos uh from tiktok from why not hi guys love your show i've got a 2013 model s with only 10,000 miles it has a lag to start up any idea why please a lag a lag um yeah um, Software issue, it sounds like? You know, I don't know. Uh, we have a Roadster in house right now that's perplexing in the same, um, uh, the same area. Um, it just doesn't seem to have the oomph and the power that the rest of the, uh, that the, rest of the Roadsters do. 
And, um, you know, we, we do a lot of reverse engineering. We dig into the firmware, we dig into the electronics, and uh, we're not always successful. Sometimes we're befuddled, and this one has us a bit confused. So what we typically do then is we reach out to the original designers, many of which we're in contact with. They don't work for Tesla anymore, but they're more than willing to give us tips and share with us. And this one, apparently, um, we're not getting any uh, information or any results yet. So mm. um, sorry we can't answer that, but that, that, that's very odd, a lag during startup. You know, the electronics in there would sense things like loose connections because um, it can actually report and uh, give you alerts. But um, for a symptom like that to exist without the firmware recognizing it is what's puzzling. And he says it takes about 40 seconds, okay? Um, well, I guess that's 40 seconds between getting in, turning it on, and then being able to put it in drive. Yeah, don't mm. know. Mm. You know what, actually, that brings up something that you kind of touched on on the last show uh, in regards to the firmware and the OS for these EVs, and it's something that I might bring up again for a, an article that we got in a bit. But in the modularity for EVs, I think that's going to be a big part of both repair and upkeep for electric cars in the future as they become more computerized, I for one welcome that. I think it's a cool thing because what that allows for is this opportunity for people who are proficient in something like Linux or something like that, that with that Tesla built its own OS on. Mm -hmm. You know, how cool would it be if you could have just multiple operating systems available if you want to, you know, change your EV settings and things like that, uh, having that in the market so that you can have firmware more specific to your vehicle. Tune and, your, yeah, tune your and car, a tuner. in other words, your right. EV, absolutely. Yeah. I think and, that'd be very And that's cool. coming, it's coming. It's just that right now, you know, the, well, the manufacturers are focused on getting vehicles out. Right. And solving problems. Uh, you know, none of them are scot-free when it comes to uh, design issues that manifest after you've made something. Exactly. it's not mature yet. But yeah, I'm looking forward to the day that we have either aftermarket or even the manufacturers participating in options, tuning, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. As we spoke uh, earlier, um, or in previous podcasts, in the critical power world, which is where we're from, 30, 40 years or so, the, um, about 20 years ago, the manufacturers provided scalability with their product. Mm. So if you didn't have a budget, you could buy a 50 kVA UPS that was capable of being uh, increased to 250 kVA size. So as your company grew, you added modules and software packages, mm -hmm. and uh, you were able to uh, you know, continue with that electrical installation and that piece of equipment without having to reinvent the whole thing. Right, yeah. I think cars will be the same way. Not everybody's gonna wanna drive a million miles you know, on a charge. Kind of an exaggeration, but let's, let's say a thousand miles on a charge. Sure, yeah, right. Um, for some, it may be more important to shave weight off the car because they want even better performance. So they'll, 200 miles is fine if you can shave 800 pounds off the car. Exactly. Yeah, it's all going to come down to user preference and how the best way to mitigate that's going to look like. And it's nice to have the options, I think, coming out as manufacturers and OE OEMs, manufacturers, third party. They all essentially create a new ecosystem around that. To I think we have a clarification on that first question oh, with the lag. Mean? Yes, it is to start up and get it into drive. 40 you know, seconds. What it's, what it's beginning to sound like uh, is the, um, uh, the MCU, uh, the chip. Mm -hmm. And um, that would be one place to start looking is um, if it's slow and it's slow to respond and slow to start up, that was one of the indications of a problem in that area. I wonder if that's also a question coming from if, if the car is still in warranty, if uh, Tesla would be able to check that out, but a 2013 may not be. Yeah, I don't know. Um, Instagram question from A Click Outside. How does the air conditioner and heater work in a Tesla? Can I warm it up before I get in? Mm, good question. Boy, you're in luck. There are applications that come with Teslas. With your cell phone, you can actually pre-warm the car. You can schedule it, you can time it, and uh, either heat or cool. So yes, it is built into the car, unlike an internal combustion engine car, which is pretty stupid still, and can't do magical things like this. Mm. Well, some of them can. The RAV4 Prime from Toyota um, has the capability to have uh, preconditioning when it comes to air conditioning and things like that. Some of them can only cool a car. 
-hmm. And some of them can only warm up the car, which I think is a bit strange. I'm sure that that's a software thing that they can always fix. But um, in the RAV4 Prime's case, when that got released a couple years ago, they actually immediately started having problems where the fob and the, and the system wouldn't actually connect. So they couldn't go out there and, uh, or they, they couldn't remotely do that in the winter, yeah, yeah, and that was a big problem because a lot of them would actually get iced over. <laughs> so right. you got to, you know, you got to be able to get the car warmed up a little bit. Um, that's a common question with EVs, I think, as well as the uh, internal temperature and how that relates to the battery. Because what how internal combustion cars work is they pull a lot of that heat from the engine, mm -hmm. and so if you're looking to get uh, warmed up real quick, then you just take that heat from the engine, get it redirected into the ventilation system, and get that's how you get your car heated. Right. Um, you don't have that with batteries because batteries are a lot more specific with the temperature that they operate at. So what are your kind of thoughts on where we're, what we're going to see with uh, heating and ventilation in that regard? Well, you know, now that you mention it, uh, there is thermal management in the EVs that are constantly maintaining a certain temperature for the battery. Um, and um, there, there could be a heat exchanger inserted into that system that would actually scavenge um, if it's heat, for example, that you need. Uh, it would be minuscule, though, because uh, you know the amount of heat that you would be able to scavenge off a heat exchanger isn't isn't uh, enough, I think, to mm -hmm. really make a difference. That's probably why they stay away from the additional expense of putting something like that in. You know, we missed the question here. It was streaming a little while ago, but I remember it clearly. The question was, and I think it was Instagram. Why are you both wearing sunglasses? <laughs> My answer to that is: Have you ever watched the Blues Brothers movies? And I leave it. I'll leave it there. Oh, that was a big <laughs> clue. Yeah, that was a very clue. That's the biggest clue I think we got yet. <laughs> That's been a well-guarded secret up until now. Um, from TikTok, from back from Why Not? What are the main issues with the older models? I'm guessing they're referring to Teslas. The biggest issues you see with Roadsters and older uh, models. Well, is yeah, we kind of need to define which model, and um, so I'll let that uh, viewer give up. Yeah, give us a bit of clarification on that. From Core Glass on YouTube, who pays the data charges on Tesla's data charge? I wonder if that's, is that referring to some, some like a Wi-Fi hotspot or is that referring to? Um, if we're talking about internet connectivity, it comes with a car. Right. Yeah. It's got, does it have a pre-built? I actually don't know this. Does it have a pre-built um, uh, hotspot? That I don't know. Oh, OK. Yeah. Our, have to get our technicians next door. Hmm. So do we want to talk about Damon motorcycles? Hey, All right. switching gears. We, um, we're fascinated by anything that is headed toward EV. And one of the most, uh, for me at least, one of the most interesting migrations is going to be the motorcycle crowd. Because there's a certain uh, image that goes with that. There's a certain amount of noise that goes with that. Chrome pipes, you know, all of that. Well, not much of that applies when you get to an electric motorcycle. There is a company called Damon Motorcycles, and uh, they claim that they are making a 200 horsepower, 200 mile top speed, and 200 mile range electric motorcycle. And can we pop that picture up, by the way? It is, um, it looks like a sports bike, except when you start taking a close look at it, once we get the picture up, I'll point that out. Um, there are some differences. This is a, by the way, a Canadian company that so far has accumulated $90 million in back orders for this product. They're not making anything yet, or at least releasing anything yet. And, um, oh, look at those. Yeah. Yeah, they're looking sweet. Got that Kawasaki Ninja kind of look to it. Looks pretty aerodynamic. The first thing that struck me was, do you see any pipes on the side? No. Completely missing. But it's cool that they are still, still able to retain that modern motorcycle look that a lot of motorcycle riders appreciate. Because I think so. that's it's the same uh, design philosophy that modern EVs have as well. Is you know how do we make it look identifiable as what people like, mm -hmm. but be able to change it for you know this uh, new technology that we're putting in there? I think they look pretty sweet. And it looks like the only thing they needed to uh, replicate was the center of the motorcycle, which is where your normal drivetrain is, which in this case will be batteries and the electric motor, or motors, possibly even plural. Um, but So there is a $90 million wait list now that includes 3,500 customers. And um, 
they um, have released the, uh, what they call here a chock full of corporate speak and unsubstantiated claims. Hmm. We can cause the accident rates to perpetually fall over the coming decade. They don't elaborate how they're going to do that, but it's an interesting claim. Um, they have not delivered either of these motorcycles yet. And um, there are some naysayers. Let's, let's see what they say. Um, the company's performance figures for customers um, consistently receiving delayed delivery dates. So they suffer from what uh, not too many other EV manufacturers suffer Pretty from. Pretty much all Which of them. is over committing and under delivering at times because of unforeseen, uh, at least stated, supply chain problems, labor problems, you know. Um, but um, it looks like this company does have the ability to actually create something at some point, and um, hopefully they won't fold under the pressure of production. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because motorcycles and cars are fundamentally different vehicles, different as um, different applications. I mean, it's a. I feel like the motorcycle is kind of a perfect fit for an electric overhaul. Um, which is ironic considering that I feel like the car is what started it, but the but you look at a motorcycle, but most of them are used in downtown areas, tighter spaces, lower ranges in the first place. Why not make it go electric? You can have all the fun you want with the same torque. You can have all that modularity you want by tuning it differently, and you're using it in the environment that it's most suited for. I know that a lot of skepticism with EVs is the range problem because so many cars are designed to go longer, more places. Yeah. Um, not necessarily in city, whereas a motorcycle, that's exactly what it's for. Now, so, does it, this mean that we're going to begin to see charging stations popping up at biker bars? Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> we also um, uh, found that uh, the factory that is being built to build uh, or to take care of this $90 million backlog is in British Columbia, so Canada is getting a piece of EV action, and a second pilot production facility in San Rafael, California, to serve its California customers. So we'll see if they can uh, actually begin to deliver product. Sure. Uh, real quick from uh, Instagram, hi, Mr. Gruber, it's Anwar from Kuwait. Hello, Anwar. Welcome back, Anwar. Uh, from, also from TikTok, ACV949, I'm having trouble getting my Model 3 aligned. Is there an issue with power distribution between left and right? It pulls to the left. That sounds like it might just be a wheel alignment issue. You could probably get that checked out at a discount tire. Yeah, you know, we, we find that uh, the traditional alignment shops struggle with EVs. Hmm. Um, we have one here in our neighborhood that uh, actually has become fairly good at it, and it's probably because we've trained them on, uh, by sending so many cars over there. But yeah, it's not for the, um, the average shop is going to struggle at times. I would say just uh, do some polling, ask the Tesla service centers, where do they take their alignment uh, needs? And uh, you know, I don't think any of the Tesla service centers are yet doing in-house alignment. Hmm although they tend to expand all the time. They're doing windshield now. Um, oh, there we go. At, at a lot of the uh, service centers, so. Um, the Which they probably need to just because there's so many sensors now going into windshields like that. I mean, even my old 20-year-old my old Lexus has sensors in the windshield, and if you try to replace yeah. that, I mean, it's good luck. Yeah. You know, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these companies will charge you a, an arm and a leg because of all the sensors, so it's kind of nice that Tesla's already got that covered because that is a big expense, and it's also because of a windshield, like you said. That's the most vulnerable win window on the car. It's the lowest to insure because they get damaged the most. Right. Um, you know, um, I've got a question up here from Instagram, Anwar, and I, 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 feel, um, I feel guilty because this was asked once before. What is the, the correct fluid for Tesla's cooling fluid? What kind of fluid and how many liters? After that podcast, um, our service manager, who they watch our podcasts often, said, oh, hey. you know, we, I texted you, and uh, this is what it takes. But I don't have a text from him today, so he's probably not watching it. Mm -hmm. Anwar, email us at ev at gruber.com, and we will get that question answered for you today. Well, here's a question that will uh, kind of tie into our next segment real quick. Have you checked out Edison Motors up in Canada? They're doing electric trucks. I have heard of uh, Edison before. I do know about them. 
and we also we promised that we would do some research and I have not at least personally but the semi truck is actually scheduled for delivery first part of next year to Pepsi and uh, that was one of the um, of the items on the last podcast I don't remember what the stats were but there is a uh, significant portion of them being delivered for use. That's Tesla, right? Tesla, the Tesla, yeah, the semi truck. Oh, I thought you were right, because I thought Edison Motors, I know that they're doing, tr there, I know they're doing pickup trucks, are they also doing semi trucks? I'll have to dig into that a little bit yeah. more, but I, I have heard about Edison Motors. Um, and it's kind of cool, because I feel like they might be doing a lot of uh, collaboration with Magna, the guys who supply a lot of those parts to mm -hmm. other uh, manufacturers and distributors, so. That's kind of cool. I'd like to see more of that. But speaking of trucks. Yeah. Well, the electric Hummer. Um, shocked the heck out of me. They are selling for $100,000 over their list price in some cases as demand outstrips supply. Now get this number. Demand outstripping supply by almost 100 to 1. Who would have thought, certainly not GM, that an EV could be this popular, or they might have gotten into this game much earlier than they did. And a Hummer, no less. Yeah, it's a, a Hummer, It's exactly. a truck that most people have considered sort of outdated. It's a military vehicle that you're using to go to the grocery store, but Correct. you know, there, there is a market out there. Oh, they've been doing that since 2002. That's, the, yeah. <laughs> that's what, but we like being able to do that. But what's fascinating to me is how it's already listed at $100,000 base price mm -hmm. and you know now that you we see this crazy markup I mean we see markups like this all over the place with EVs uh, Rivians are reselling for you know almost double what they're bought for and things like that or maybe you know, 20,000 over sticker price but for the Hummer EV just such a massive vehicle to have that kind of demand I think is so interesting a massive vehicle with a massive imbalance between supply and demand Ain't that just um, the way. Actually, fun fact, I think I started telling you about this, but there was an event over here at State Farm Stadium a few months ago where GM was um, uh, showing off some of those uh, trucks. Unfortunately, one of them was actually stolen and luckily returned a few, uh, about a week later. Uh, but it was stolen off the lot because they had, you know, 20 odd trucks just kind of sitting there. And I guess one right. of them forgot to be locked. <laughs> Uh -oh. So part of the problem is is that GM is only building 12 of these per day. And uh, somebody pointed out that based on the current demand, it would, it's going to take them 17 years to deliver on all its reservations at this current rate. So GM, you need to beef up your production. We need to get into the EV game in a much larger way than you have been. My prediction is that it's got everything to do with batteries. I mean, that pack is massive. Mm -hmm. It's a huge battery pack. I think that pack alone, if I remember the stat, stat right, is that the pack alone weighs somewhere around 3,000 pounds. Wow. It's just unbelievably dense. I mean, if there's going to be any vehicle that's going to um, do well from solid state battery technology or just other kinds of battery technology, it's going to be that sucker. So GM is committing more resources to EV production. Apparently, they are going to invest $760 million. That's almost a billion dollars, guys, into EV part production at its Ohio factory. Um, and this, um, this Hummer, by the way, is a thousand horsepower truck and uh, trailblazing in the world of electric vehicles with a 350 mile range. Now the ability to go zero to 60, now bear in mind the weight, the size, zero to 60 in about three seconds. That is unprecedented in the internal combustion engine world. Um, it also has a convertible infinity roof, yeah, okay, but it's got a crab mode which can rotate the wheels to drive diagonally. Which is also uh, GM specific, because I believe that technology is also coming to the, uh, the new GMC um, EV Denali. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also going to the Silverado EV. You know, the only time I've ever driven anything that had crab mode, we, had a, um, we rented a gigantic forklift to move sea containers that we had in our compound. And uh, I remember, because um, I love driving and, uh, you know, uh, vehicles and mechanical stuff, I decided that I would try moving the sea container with this crab mode forklift. 
and I quickly realized that my skills did not match the capabilities oh, of this no. vehicle. It was pretty substantial. So our uh, machine shop manager, who builds rock crawlers, came along, and next thing you know, he's moving this thing around, and he was able to put it in crab mode and. Put, he placed those sea containers. It was like a needle, you know, being threaded. Oh my perfectly. gosh, I can't even imagine. What we did was we put four of them together, stacked them on top of each other. Oh, there to, you go. To, to, you know, maximize the amount of vertical space that we can but capture. But the way that you navigate yourself in that kind of vehicle yeah. has got to be just a completely out-of-body experience. Oh, it was weird watching the wheels suddenly from going straight like this, the rear wheels going sideways, and, you know, just like the front wheels. You step on the gas and you're going sideways. Well, yeah, and then you have to think about what have I just done to the trajectory of this vehicle? Yeah, and of right. Course, if you're not used to it, you're not, uh, you know, you're not going to get your head around that immediately. Especially so if you didn't mean to. Which, luckily, they've got that kind of dialed, so yeah. you know you can't accidentally go into crab walk on something like the highway or anything like that. Uh, so if we're ready for a picture, I've got a picture here of cost of EV battery replacement. Yeah, which on that kind of note, yeah, talking about you know yeah. the Hummer EV needing batteries and things like that, and knowing that they're going to be putting more uh, cost production into that. But it's nice to be able to see that there's more support for just that battery replacement because you mentioned it a little bit earlier and that. We don't talk about that when it comes to ICE vehicles. You don't talk about having to replace the engine every, you know, 10 right. years or so. Yeah, how many people buy a vehicle and are focused on, oh, uh, I'm, I'm going to do a comparison between these ICE vehicles. Which one has the lowest engine replacement cost right. <laughs> or the lowest, uh, you know, uh, transmission replacement cost? But in the world of EVs, because there have been there's so much discussion and so many people have been traumatized when they take their Model S to the service center and they say, well, you know, it's out of warranty now. Your battery's bad. It's going to be $22,000 to fix your $30,000 car. Um, so it is a large focus right now. Right. And we'll, it'll eventually subside as battery costs go down. But do we have that image up yet, guys? I'll start uh, referencing it. Okay. So what I found interesting was is the disparity of pricing. Um, your, okay, BMW i3, $2,500 to $16,000. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the parameters which uh, actually generated this pricing, and that would be handy. Mm -hmm. But what is a $2,500 battery? That's something we're what gonna have to research. What is a $16,000 battery on the complete other end? I mean, that's on a the bolt. huge disparity. Yeah. Yeah. Now, see, on the Bolt, there is no range. It's 16,000 to 16,250. All right, there you go. Now, on the Chevy Volt, and there's only one letter difference between those two vehicles, if you think about it. And a one Sony, gas engine difference, because yeah. it's a plug-in hybrid, in case uh, some people didn't know that. Right, and it comes way down, 3000 to $8,000. The Hyundai Ioniq, um, $2,800. And this is not the same as the Ioniq 5. That it gets its uh, that the Ioniq 5 gets its name from. This is the original Ioniq that well, Hyundai's been yeah. producing since... This what? is where our need for research, I think, comes in. Where right. We need to, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit more. Yeah. Um, and then we go on here. Nissan Leaf, um, 5000 to 9500 uh, The Tesla Model 3, actually less than the Model S. Fifteen seven versus 22000 for the Model S. Now, in all fairness, I think that these stats are a bit old because the, uh, what we've been hearing from customers is that the quotes that are coming on the old Model S's, the first generations, or the 2012, 13, 14s, um, it is a bit lower than $22,000 now, so they're improving. But uh, the Volkswagen Golf, man, that one's way up there. I think that's the highest one on this list, 23442 mm -hmm. You know, this raises a couple of things. One, you look at the only plug-in hybrid that's on here, or sorry, I think the Ionic is also uh, a plug-in hybrid. But, but between the two of those, I mean, those are plug-in hybrid. They have a gas engine in them. You have a smaller battery that you have to replace. So it's, it does make an argument that when we talk about electric vehicles, we don't always necessarily mean battery electric vehicles. The plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, or PHEV, that's a, another kind of EV, and a lot of people don't seem to take that into consideration when we talk, have these discussions about the future of electricity, because all an electrified vehicle means is simply having a battery to help support the motor system. Right. So whether that's completely off of one battery, a battery EV, or that's gonna be a plug-in hybrid, or just a regular hybrid, we can see the obvious advantages of having a vehicle electrified, both between gas mileage and power, and so that's what makes 
full battery electric vehicle is exciting because you can get all of that for um, you know, an increased efficiency by 90%. I think, right, is that a BEV is about 90% efficient yeah, compared to a gas higher, car? Yeah, yeah. So uh, lots to look forward to with that, but it does raise the question, you know, what does that kind of look like in the future as we see more production scaling for batteries? How many different technologies are we going to see in there um, in bringing costs down and things like that? I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, very cool. Have a question there? From uh, Bob T on TikTok, can't see your eyes, don't trust anything you're saying. Yep, you're right. To take it all for a grain of salt. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, we have we've got great answers as to why we have sunglasses, and it's not just because the future is bright. Yeah, that, that, that's that's a good one. And uh, we will eventually release a video that explains why Pete Gruber is always wearing sunglasses in the videos, and. Um, we're building up to that, though, so we want you to uh, subscribe and be ready and hit that bell button because when we release it, you will all be enlightened as to why these glasses, these sunglasses, are always on. That is now, a good point. I did explain why I wear a beanie in Phoenix in the wintertime, and uh, that one I don't mind sharing. It's because I have no hair, and I lose an enormous amount of heat through my head, so this <laughs> keeps it warm and keeps me cozy. And so does this one, too, and it also keeps you fashionable. Right. <laughs> As my co-pilot, he has an aviator. Exactly. Yeah. Um, TikTok, I-Parallel, uh, M-I-B. Was there another acronym? Uh, was there another comment from them, M-I-B? No, he's just comparing you all to the Men in Black. Oh, <laughs> Men in Black. Oh, Death <laughs> and Men in Black. There you go. <laughs> you know, there was a character in the uh, last century and I'm dating myself here perhaps, but I think it was either 80s or 90s, called Max Headroom. I've heard about Max Headroom. I, I haven't dug into it too much. He was cool. I mean, it was, a, it was the closest thing we had at that time to artificial intelligence. Okay. You didn't know whether it was a guy with a costume or if it was a uh, simulation, software simulation. And uh, he tended to bounce a lot, kind of like our video editing at times, <laughs> where we're, you know, we're chopping around. But um, anyway, he inspired those of us in that generation. And, oh, that's uh, so funny. So you have to give us some room here to uh, express our individuality. And uh, sunglasses, at least for me, is part of that. Oh, it builds character. It's all yeah. part, of the, part of the show. From Rogue Raver on TikTok, thoughts on the Rivian? There's a lot of thoughts I personally have on Rivians. Yeah, you were sharing um, some the other uh, just I, this morning. I enjoy Rivians. I think that they're a very cool company. Um, I know the Out of Spec Reviews channel has been doing a lot of R1S testing and coverage, which is really f interesting to look at, especially right now as temperatures cool. Not typically great for batteries, so it's kind of fun to see what, how batteries and battery um, EVs tend to react in colder climates. Uh, but in terms of Rivian themselves, I just think they're the coolest things. It is crazy to me that you can still get a quad motor, uh, all-wheel drive Rivian for less than $100,000. For what you get out of that truck, like, granted, I don't have $100,000 to spend on a Rivian. Not many people do. But if you're going to do it, you get all the truck you could possibly ever ask for out of one vehicle. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a bargain <laughs> in a strange way. And I, you know, I'm saying this is someone obviously and not going to get a Rivian anytime soon. Maybe in the future I'll look at a used one. But um, they, they, I think that they're uh, fascinating. Well, that's, that's my other uh, uh, question is uh, what will happen to resale on these? If you're looking for a used one, will it be within a price range? You know, mm -hmm. um, What we don't know yet is how these cars are going to hold their value. Of course, if they come out with major technological improvements from the first generation to later generations, then yeah, you've got a good shot at picking one up, you know, used at a fairly reasonable price. Which is interesting because we can look at Teslas as a, sort of a peek into what that future looks like. Because Teslas mm -hmm. hold their value extremely well. Mm -hmm. You can typically you you won't find many uh, used Teslas in good working condition for, you know, much less than their MSRP. And it seems like whenever the Teslas, the older Teslas, begin to diminish in value a bit, something happens on the uh, fossil fuel front, and suddenly they're back in demand. Yeah, you yeah. Know? I mean, I was, watching, I was watching the prices of used vehicles during this uh, inflationary period when uh, fuel began to go way up, and then, of course, the thing in Europe. And, uh, yeah, so it's going to fluctuate. I don't think we'll have too many bargains. Oh, wait a minute. We've got um, a TikTok comment. 
Brangwin. He was a little jumpy. We're talking about Max Headroom. Talk, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was jumpy. From YouTube, from Sony Test, do you think Tesla will integrate and, yeah, integrate and a HUD system anytime in the near future? Do you think they're going to see like a, um, I've seen that on some BMWs that they'll have the holographic HUD that oh. only the driver can see. Yeah, I've seen simulations of that. Um, you know, the question is anytime in the near future, it's a foregone conclusion. We're going to see stuff like this in the future. The question is when. Right. Who's working on it? And when will they release it? And, uh, you know, one of the things I found interesting about Tesla currently, when Elon said, you know, we've got uh, legions of designers and um, we've got mature products out there now. You know, the Model Y being the latest Model 3, right. of course, before then. And uh, so we've got to turn their direction to something else. And uh, it's stuff like this that will eventually begin to uh, take the limelight. Um, Speaking of Model Ys, that's a yeah. really good transition because that's our next story, actually. It is. Model Y took the top spot on the list of best-selling cars in Europe in September. Um, over the years, Tesla vehicles have often become best-selling vehicles in certain European markets or certain regions or certain countries. But this is the first time that the Model Y has actually become the best-selling vehicle in entire the entire uh, countries of Europe. There were, in September, apparently 29,000 Model Ys registered, and that's up 227% from last year. Now, you might ask, well, where did all these cars come from suddenly, right? Right. I think the demand was always there. They now have the production capacity with Giga Berlin. And um, that connection is actually made later on in this article where they talk about uh, the production rate in Berlin currently is running at 2,000 Model Y vehicles in the week ending September. So extrapolate that out and uh, we can easily see how they can get up to 100,000 within a year mm -hmm. if they're doing 2,000 per week. Yep, it's just, it's directly reflective of what's happened in China with Giga Shanghai, mm -hmm. which is kind of incredible to see that you're exactly right. You have now demand matching supply and a lot more tightly and that's what the market deems is the best value. And I'm so proud of the Europeans. You know, these are not inexpensive cars compared to what they were used to buying, but um, there definitely is a, a strong focus in Europe uh, into clean energy. Um, Germany, I think, uh, probably leading the pack. Norway is another one that's leading the pack. I think the per capita EV ownership in Norway is off the chart. It's the highest in Europe. So um, yeah, we're, we're headed in the right direction in Europe, and Tesla's there to support that, uh, that demand. I know that we'd mentioned it on another show, but it would be very cool to see a lot of the infrastructure that Germany has copied over here as well. Yeah. Uh, since you're right that they do just a tremendous job. There's been uh, a lot of videos out on what that actually looks like. And I think I'd also mentioned Rivian's already started copying that with their own um, pre-production chargers that they plug all their vehicles into before they get them shipped out. Right. Um, so it'd be really cool to see a lot of that integration. I think we're going to see that more um, in the future. Something I've been thinking about, and you may have some thoughts on this, is all of this kind of technology when it comes to you know public charging or inductive coupling even that we can see in streets. I feel like that's going to be more centered around these higher population areas, things like cities, and then going out maybe into suburban areas. Um, it's more cost effective. Yeah, it's much more you cost have a much effective. Larger exactly. customer base. Yeah, and so I think that the, a lot of the criticism for EVs comes from people that aren't necessarily in those areas, and that's a good point. Mostly because you're right; they may or may not be made for that audience. We were talking a bit ago about plug-in hybrids versus BEVs and the benefits that go across that. But what I'm finding more encouraging is that in these big cities where before it was kind of a non, not, not a non-issue, but it was a neglected issue when it comes to overall air quality and pollution and just the vast amount of infrastructure that's needed to keep a city afloat. Getting things like this new electrified technology and getting this cool uh, German style integration, I think is gonna be a huge help. I think it's gonna be really cool to see in the next, in the next decade or so what that's gonna look like.
And so much easier to uh, justify the uh, the infrastructure development when you have a large customer base. Mm -hmm. You know things like charging stations, superchargers, whatever. And that it's natural demand too, because I think that a lot of it is also, you know, how much does uh, government subsidy come into play when it comes to building this infrastructure, and whether or not that creates an artificial demand. But as we can see from both Germany and other parts of Europe, as well as as China that the demand is there naturally. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have to necessarily worry about all that. And that's really encouraging for me as someone who really likes you know, personal freedom when it comes to uh, being able to choose freedom in the market. Yeah. Well, Pete, uh, yeah. weren't we um, the recipients of a government subsidy, right? We had APS come out here essentially on a government grant and they gave us chargers at multiple buildings of ours. That is, that is cool. Yeah. We, um, we were contacted by the local utility. You know, the, um, the utilities get a lot of flack uh, that they're not supporting uh, green, clean energy initiatives. And uh, when the federal government comes along and uh, plops a bunch of money in their lap and says, you know, if you can find ways to promote clean energy, we're going to give you some grants. Hey. Uh, they go out and find customers fairly quickly. And they came to us because they realized that we were one of the, uh, the largest, well, the largest independent EV shop in the state of Arizona and uh, asked us, could we use some charging stations? We said, absolutely. So yes, two of our buildings have uh, chargers that allow our customers and ourselves to uh, charge uh, directly. That is very cool. Yeah, destination chargers. And we don't nice. have superchargers. And Pete, I know we talked about this on the last um, show or the show before with Aaron, but I don't think, Zane, you might not have been here for this, where we were talking about Biden's new multi-billion dollar plan that got approved and how he's because you're, you're talking about rural areas earlier um he's going to be putting apparently every 50 miles on the interstates out in the most rural areas possible he's going to be putting actual superchargers not just regular destination chargers but right. but fast charging stations all go. throughout the nation i don't which now, of course, is going to be supported by interstate traffic. Mm -hmm. So I think that was a justification there. You know, in uh, rural America, the farmers, um, you know, uh, may not need that much infrastructure. But certainly on an interstate highway system, federally funded, um, you know, you have a lot of travelers that would, uh, that would avail themselves of this. Yeah. No, I think that's great. It's good to see that there's the support that's going to go in that way. And same with Rivian. Mm -hmm. how they actually have their own Rivian Adventure network that they're trying to build out themselves independently um, for that same reason. Um, but they're not going along the highways the way that the uh, federal government will be. Yeah. So it's nice that, yeah, we're going to get a nice, good, comfortable infrastructure coming up within the next decade. Hey, guys, can we throw the cyber quad image up there and we'll entertain a few questions before we launch into that topic? Uh, yeah, but like I'm pulling that up now, and just so you know, we have about five to ten minutes left. Five to ten minutes, okay. All right. That, that should we be good. <clears throat> so one final uh, question here was from uh, Brangwin, who asked earlier about the HUD, uh, but why we don't need a HUD? Well, <clears throat> you know, in the world of technology, need and want blur. Mm. And uh, I know raising my kids, that was always a uh, question I would ask them. Well, you, you, you need this or you want this? There is a critical difference. <laughs> yes. Um, when it comes to technology, if it's cool, you know, people are going to invent a need for it. Well, um, I think the... Sorry, I have myself muted. I think the, the thing that's more important in that conversation is that they don't replace standard instrumentation with an HUD because... That yeah. may not be as reliable, right? Good point. Which we have uh, some stuff in the works regarding that exact issue. I know that um, uh, with the, the criticism that comes with digital displays is that if the whole thing goes out, you don't have any more instruments You're to go You're just out of luck, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, that image is up, by the way. It perfect. is. Okay, perfect. So here's a headline. And this one reminded me that oftentimes in the world of comedy, you don't need to fabricate a funny story. You just look at reality, and uh, you see a lot of humor <laughs> in reality. Well, this one had me chuckling this morning. And the headline was, Radio Flyer recalls and kills the Tesla Cyber Quad for kids due to a federal safety standard violation. So here, here's the story on this. This little Cyber Quad, by the way, is a toy for children, all right? Um, 
The Tesla Cyber Quad for kids is no more. If you purchase the ATV um, all-terrain vehicle for your kids, you're going to have to break the news to them that it was that it needs to now be taken apart as a company has issued a recall for the ATV. And their method of recalling it is rather than you packaging this you know big uh, item into a box and shipping it somewhere you have to take a controller out of it and that satisfies the requirement that you fundamentally disabled your vehicle all right so according to the um, the company radio flyer the cyber quad doesn't meet federal mandatory safety standard requirements for youth ATVs some of those requirements include having a mechanical suspension and maximum tire pressure well this is a plastic toy I mean, right I, yeah, we're going a little bit overboard <laughs> here right and along with having these or lacking these, the CyberQuad also lacks a CPSC approved ATV action plan. I love these acronyms. All right. What this means is. The whole is, alphabet right there. Yeah. There are numerous safety uh, requirements in this plan, apparently, such as rider training. What? You're going to take your four year old and send him to school to ride this little plastic ATV? All right. Dissemination of safety information. Well, put a brochure into the box along with it, right? Um, age recommendations um, and other safety measures. These ATV safety hazards and other justifying, these ATV safety standards are in place to reduce crash and injury hazards, preventing serious injury or death. The Consumer Protection Safety Commission, which, by the way, is what this uh, part of this acronym stands for, the mm. CPSC, SC, recall notice reads, since these are missing, the radio flyer has been forced to recall the more than 5,000 cyber quad for kids that have been sold. Now, here's the justification for this, and this is where I really started to laugh. According to CPSC, there has been one reported incident out of 5,000, mind you, of a female, 36-year-old female, who was riding the cyber quad for kids with her 8-year-old son. Well, it wasn't built for adults, first of all. It certainly wasn't built for two <laughs> right. people. So might you have been irresponsible in attempting to ride this thing? But it goes further. Um, as a result, the cyber quad tipped over and the 36-year-old female suffered a bruise to her left shoulder. A whole bruise? Yeah. <laughs> oh, jeez. Ban the whole thing. Get that thing back in the furnace. It's just horrible. But you know what's funny about... The, the funniest part to me is just how, never mind how uh, perfectly poetic it is uh, that it matches perfectly Santa Claus is coming to town with Burgermeister Meisterburger taking all the children's toys away. <laughs> And also, it, they already put age limits and requirements on toys anyways. Legos, uh, Lego is historically famous for being uh, for ages 9 to 99. Mm -hmm. And every toy in existence, as far as I know, has some kind of age limit attached on it. So mm -hmm. it, it's, that was just a parent trying to have some fun. And they got a bruise. So here's, here's some more government overreach now. <laughs> this Consumer Protection Safety Commission, the CPSC, recall notice says, owners must immediately stop using the cyber quad and contact Radio Flyer for a full refund. Now I wonder, what is the penalty if you don't do that? How are they going to enforce this? They're gonna have are we really going to send people to jail <laughs> because they didn't comply? Um, but anyway, the full refund can only be received after removing the product's motor controller and sending the controller back to Radio Flyer via a prepaid envelope. This will now, of course, disable the cyber quad and render it unusable, so you've got some trash at this point. Nah, still, I'm not gonna mail anyone money like that. But I might as well put it in a birthday card. Put it in a child's birthday card. <laughs> Make them feel bad about it. Now, we do have a comment here from TikTok. From it's probably true. Jake in real time, that there is no such thing as a safe ATV. That's correct, but yeah. that doesn't make them boring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the whole point. You they get an fun. ATV because it's fun, mm -hmm. not because it's safe. From uh, Brangwin again, thanks for the interaction this morning. Looking forward to the next one. I agree. Thanks, Brangwin, for getting to come on, come on in and uh, chat with us today. You know, we've got a, um, a new video that we're going to be releasing. Um, do you think this week, guys? 
drone video. Yes. Yes, okay, perfect. Woo. We've been working on this one for three weeks or more, I would say. And um, you're gonna like this one. What this is, we have a tiny little drone that's been modified. Uh, to shave weight, they took the housing off of the um, camera, um, GoPro camera, and um, this little guy is actually able to zip in between stuff that the normal camera holding individual could never do. So without giving away too much, we sent this little mini drone in through our service center. And the shots that you're going to see are stunning. Every time I watch it, I'm captivated for a good two to three minutes. They combined it with some upbeat music, and it is definitely entertaining every time I watch it. So we'll be releasing that. Make sure you watch our YouTube channel for the release. And if you want to see it being released and want to catch it immediately and be one of the first to view it, hit that bell button, and you'll be alerted that we've posted another new video. That's a sneaky way of getting you to subscribe, by the way, if you've noticed that. To like and subscribe. Like and subscribe, <laughs> yes. And that's true for everybody on TikTok, Instagram. We love to get to see you guys do the same. We really appreciate all of you joining us. I understand if things went well today from the production side of things that we've had eight streaming platforms. We will continue to boost the production quality. Let me know if you like those pictures behind me because I've got plenty more to share or we'll do something different. You let us know because our goal is to entertain our audience and keep them informed. So again, these podcasts take place Tuesday mornings at 8.30 Mountain Standard Time, Thursday morning at 8.30 Mountain Standard Time. And be sure to check us out on all those other platforms from Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. I'm probably leaving out a bunch of them here, but. We're, so, we're everywhere now, we're, we're worldwide. <laughs> So again, we appreciate you joining us. Thank you for joining us as well, uh, Zane. And we will, uh, we will be entertaining you again in two days. Pete, always a pleasure. And thank you all for so much for uh, joining us.